<clears throat> as I said at the very beginning, this is Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday, pretty much all of Acts chapter 2 is Pentecost. So I'm, I'm not going to stand up here and read the entire chapter. So I have some snippets from Acts chapter 2 that I'll read now, starting with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like a rush of violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I have to say. And then dropping down to verse 22, Peter went on to say, You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power and wonders and signs that God did through him among you. As you yourselves know, this man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Then dropping down a few more. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom our Lord calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. It's the word of God. Okay, so it's Pentecost Sunday. Um, last week we finished a four or five week sermon series on justice, and now we get back in sync, at least for one day, with the Christian calendar. Pentecost, Penta, right? Pentagon, right? Five, 50 days after Easter. But before we jump right into Pentecost, let's go over again the context of what is happening. The Gospel of Matthew ends with a fairly well-known passage. This is the end of chapter 28, where Jesus says, again, this is after the resurrection and just before he ascends to heaven for the final time, Jesus says to the apostles, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So this, in church circles, we refer to as the Great Commission, and there's a future sermon or two in that set of verses alone. Luke ends rather similarly, but with a twist. Luke ends with this, Jesus again, after the resurrection, before the ascension, says to the disciples, repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And see, I'm sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. So Jesus is saying, go, proclaim the word in all the nations, but wait, not yet. Wait until you are, quote, clothed with power from on high. So over these past X number of days, the disciples have been waiting in Jerusalem. Pentecost, 50 days after Easter, <clears throat> 
So that means 52 or 53 days since Jesus was arrested, tried, and crucified. We don't know what the duration is between Jesus' ascension when he gave that great commission and Pentecost. Don't know what that duration is, but we know it's a little less than two months. Back to Easter, back to Good Friday, back to that Thursday when Peter denied he even knew who Jesus was. So now, less than two months later, Peter is preaching in public in front of thousands of people. So something dramatic changed during that two-month period of time that made Peter so courageous just two months later. And what made those 3,000 people commit their lives to faith in a leader who was just killed? A couple of things. First, obviously, the resurrection and the appearances of Christ. Let's remember most of this stuff, Easter, the resurrection, the appearances of Christ, most of it occurred within Jerusalem. So if there are 3,000 people gathered at Pentecost, it's possible and even likely that some of those people had been among the crowds when Jesus appeared after the resurrection. He appeared in the upper room to the 11. He appeared to Mary in the cemetery initially. He appeared to small groups like the two men walking down the road to Emmaus. He appeared to large groups. There are 13 appearances of Jesus after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, and before he ascended into heaven. The power of that is hard to even imagine. The second thing, obviously, is this appearance of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit that I just read about, and it's quite spectacular. There came from heaven the sound of a rush of violent wind, and it filled the entire house, and there were flames like tongues of fire that appeared and rested on each of the people there. And they were given the ability to speak in languages they'd never, ever spoken before. Whether that's a literal description of what happened or a metaphorical or poetic description of what happened, in either way, it's a dramatic description of a scene that we can only imagine. Passage goes on to say, there were devout Jews of every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And the crowd gathered was bewildered because each one heard speaking in their native language. So the, the speaking of tongues, the speaking in other language wasn't just some sort of gibberish. It was actually speaking in other languages of the people who were gathered there because those who were gathered understood the language being spoken. All were amazed and perplexed by this, but others sneered, saying, eh, they're filled with new wine. Peter stood up, saying, these men are not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. One of my favorite Bible verses, by the way. This is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And then Peter went on to preach, reviewing this prophecy from Joel about the end times and concluding with, now everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'm really trying to encapsulate this story because it goes on and I would encourage you to read Acts chapter two, but in summary, Jesus is, uh, Jesus, Peter is preaching before thousands of Jews in Jerusalem, less than two months after the crucifixion. So that crucifixion is still fresh in everybody's mind. And for believers in the way, as the church was described in those days, Jerusalem is still a dangerous place to be. Peter preaches of the resurrection and the appearances of Christ, presumably with firsthand accounts among the crowd that were gathered. This reminder of the Old Testament prophecy or the Hebrew Bible testimony from the prophet Joel, plus Peter's own prophecy about what was to come in the end times. And the people believed. The people heard Peter 
saw what was happening, and they believed. And that day, about 3,000 persons were added to the church. So when we read this account, whether we read it poetically or as, a, as, as prose, as prophecy, something amazing is going on here. And again, I'm repeating it myself, but it's just 52 days after Jesus was killed. The scribes and the Pharisees had grown afraid of Jesus' increasing power and influence, so they convinced Rome to have him killed. It's hard for us to imagine the risk of being a believer in Jerusalem, because we got up this morning and drove to church without any risk, really, at all to being here. But that spring and in those times, the scribes and the Pharisees had gotten Jesus killed, believing that his followers would dissipate, would evaporate. You know the cliche, if you want to kill a snake, you cut off the head of the snake and the body will, you, will fall apart. But that's not what happened. What the scribes and the Pharisees feared would happen, happened anyway, happened nonetheless. This new Christian faith, while clearly founded in Jesus, was not following Jesus in the human form, but in the spiritual form. Killing Jesus did nothing to stop the movement. Jesus rose from the dead. He appeared to many, as I said a moment ago. He appeared to Mary in the cemetery and the disciples in the upper room, to small groups, to large groups. And then, according to Luke, he gave the disciples an assignment to go and spread the word, but not yet, to wait until they were strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in one day, in spite of the personal and political risk, the church grew from a hundred or a couple of hundred to 3,000. It's about the arrival of the Holy Spirit, the tongues of fire. And Peter, the first post-resurrection church planter, the movement had taken hold. So Pentecost Sunday, it's about Peter and the others. It's about the formulation of the church, to be sure. But more than that, it's about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who emboldened Peter and the disciples to proclaim the gospel despite the risks. And the Holy Spirit who inspired those who heard what Peter had to say to change the way they were living their lives and form this new church. Again, in spite of the risks, and notwithstanding, change is hard. Any change is hard. The Holy Spirit, foretold by Jesus. As I was talking to the kids earlier, in John 14, Jesus says, and I will ask the Father to give you another advocate, or helper, the footnote says, to be with you forever. The advocate will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Also described by Paul. In chapter 8, Paul writes, and this is one of the most beautiful verses about prayer, Gary's opinion, in the Bible. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for when we do not know how to pray as we ought, that very Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. We don't need to know what to say. We just need to come to the Lord in prayer and the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the helper will intercede for us. The Holy Spirit sent to be with us forever, to intercede for us, to teach us, to remind us of those things we've been taught but need reminding of from time to time and to speak on our behalf when we have no words. There's no greater symbol of God's love for us than this description of the Holy Spirit, sent to abide with us forever, the helper. So, let's be bold in our faith. 
whether that means achieving great things or just getting through the day, which sometimes is a great thing. Let us believe in the power of God. Let us embrace the power of the Holy Spirit. And let us believe that we have, quote, been clothed with power from on high. The world is full of anxious, insecure, apprehensive people. We all feel that way from time to time. But let us remember we're never alone. We walk with Jesus we walk with the Holy Spirit, the helper, the advocate. We never walk alone. So let us step out in faith, seeking to do God's will, knowing that in that walk, we will be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Amen.